judges are Summer Whitmore. So a bio from Summer. Uh, this is my second year, third year, sorry, at Goffstown High School, and I love it. I teach math, but I started writing poetry in high school, and then spent three years touring around the U.S., reading poems at different venues, and living out of my car after I graduated. I'm still an active writer, and I participate in open mics and workshops whenever possible. Summer Whitmore. Our second judge is Ashley LaFond. Uh, newly engaged uh, guidance extraordinaire. She didn't put that in there, I put that in there. So. Um, Ashley says, this is my second year at Goffstown High School as a school counselor, but I actually graduated from GHS 10 years ago. Mrs. Brown was my teacher senior year and inspired me to major in English in college. It takes a lot of courage to stand up and recite something you've written, so you should all feel very proud of yourselves. Thank you for including me in your Poetry Slam competition. And last but not least, we have Kylie Connolly. So um, Kylie is in her fourth year teaching at uh, English at GHS. She also graduated from here in 2007. When she's not at school, Ms. Connolly loves spending time with her dog and her family, as well as running and eating delicious food. I think we all like that. She's very excited to be part of this poetry slam and can't wait to see what the seniors have created for the competition. Kylie Connolly. <laughs> So again, after all poets have performed, our judges will confer. That might take about 10 minutes. We might have a musical interlude um, from Mr. DeRocher and our fantastic chorus. And um, before we are announcing our top three and our school champion. And our school champion will be invited to perform on the night of Poetry Out Loud. So mark your calendars for an encore performance. That's going to be January 12th at 7 o'clock in the evening here in the theater. So. Um, with no further ado, we'll call our first person up to the stage. Mother's Day. Inch by inch, the water moves, climbing up the house. It creeps through the small doors. It comes unannounced. The rushing water hugs my house with its cold, dirty hands. Mother's Day 2006 did not go as planned. A few shirts are packed as if we're leaving for a day, but little did we know it would never be the same. Leaving everything behind, I wish I had grabbed just one toy. For my dolls, my stuffed animals, my Polly Pockets, they were soon all destroyed. For the carousels of the car submerged in the knee-deep puddle, it swirls of brown, loopy mud. It smells of tar and rubble. As we drive off through the small river, I ask, when will we be back? A simple question from a six-year-old turns into the hardest one to ask. She didn't say we were homeless, although we didn't have a home. We slept on beds, air mattresses, and couches for a total of six homes. Eight months soon pass, in the blink of an eye, my eyes become blurry, we all start to cry. Five inches from the ceiling was where the water rose, shown with a chip paint and a little bit of mold. Pictures of tie-dye blended with colors, movies float in chunky water. For everything you touch, pours brown moisture out. The couch, the carpet, the walls, the whole entire house. The floor is piled high with discolored sand. I cannot look anymore, I walk out, my broken doll in my hand. It's time to say goodbye and hello to a new day. We cannot dwell on what's happened. Instead, find the good in each and every day. I could go and talk about hope, but hope is happy. Happy is easy. Hearing is hard, and it only gets harder. Harder of hearing as you become older, and hearing is harder the older you are. But harder than hearing, when hard of hearing, when older, is listening. Believing. I ask for belief when another man speaks or to listen to words when you're reading. Why are children treated like pets? I still think that you're human. I still want to listen to you. I still think that you have the sense to see your own guilt, look back and repent. I don't think they see your lives have been hurt. I don't think you tell them. So I'll tell you so you'll believe me, so you can go on the truth without needing faith and can listen if you're hard of hearing or reading, just being. That's all I ask now is your seeing. When you look into the eyes of those chilling, how chilling a sight it should be. 
Those children been given nothing but debt and a birthright to failure and a life of regret while they, while we, are given to hearing that those, that these are the golden years. That we should be young for the rest of our lives if only we could be so lucky. And even though our minds are most pure and our bodies are so strong and so plucky, I am meant to take from you all orders that you give me, us. While we are learning hearts burning and young by the fire, we are hungry for stories to share. And it is natural, and all was good, but they beat me down, us. They beat us down, those strange or those less strange and different, those who just aren't their father's son or mother's daughter, or what queer possessions of Satan may have caused such dilapidated youth. They listen to rock, not their teachers. So I ask you, which tells us the truth? We are as one, though this is my story. And though mine is not the worst, I will fight for those whose life is brought down by shadows of nooses behind their white church. I ask to fight for those women whose minds write oceanic harems for one, whose understanding of the world around her has only just begun. For those who like to drive fast, live in the past, or just spend a day in the sun, who will never need another batch of sunblock, who know they're still the special one. I have a dream that one day these speeches won't be the only ones we know. Why are we, who all know what it means to be free, not rising up to be a rebel? I think it's because you weren't listening. Don't know if I lost you at points A, B, or C, but it shouldn't be that hard to get here. That it's wrong we're encaged till the bell. I think that all adults forget the misery that they went through then, because once they're 18, they're free to be mean to the kids that they have. Might as well. There are no laws against it, no rules, no rights, no committees. I know, I've looked, there is no pity, no civil rights. It would appear that our metaphorical happiness goose is thoroughly and violently cooked. It sickens me to see this sadness, which seems like it just won't end, when parents look down on their children and treat us with no respect. So taste and savor the salt-soaked steak, because when it is done, I will need you to starve, and starve free, for me. It's a shame that they won't listen to your voice, but I still will. This poem's uh, for my mother. Uh, it's called My Rock. Thinking back. Let me take a second to reminisce, thinking back to when you were around and what I miss. I'm trying to steady my thoughts, but my mind's racing. I'm wondering if I can catch what I've been chasing for so many years. Love, happiness, so many tears. It's crazy how things change. I mean, I'm so grateful, but I wish it was different, and I wish you were faithful to the ones I love. And yeah, also me. But I know my wishes can never, ever set you free, because we had our good times, and yeah, I know we had our bad, but I guess that shit was just a fad because now you left me feeling sad and wondering why I ever had the courage to call you my dad. I know. Who am I to complain? I'm a privileged young kid who doesn't even know pain, but maybe just ask my sister and then you can pick the brain of someone who knows what it's like to grow up with this man in your life and have him stab you in the back with a knife, a man who thinks you're less important than a pipe and girls appealing to his sight. I wish I could take a bite of his corrupted mind. Does he think about us now? Does he wish he could rewind? If I could go inside and see, well, maybe then I find a second chance or just some more messed up visions of crime. I don't know. The worst feeling in the world is to see your mom struggle. She's going to work and yet still has to juggle between being a mom and dealing with this son of a bitch thinking he got money, but he ain't really rich. Because secretly he's losing everything that even exists and at the same time, my mom is just trying to keep. The ground is slowly slipping away right under her feet. She's praying 24 hours and seven days a week. She's praying for the week. She's praying like, why does he have to deceive, lie, and cheat and still never miss a beat? Yeah, she's the best. And I know we all say that, but this time is for real, so you know I don't play that. For once, all of this is just coming straight from my soul. I'm wondering how to completely fill this very deep hole. I don't know. I'm going right back in. All this for my next of kin, because in this shitty situation, there is no loser win. Every time I think that I'm about to sin, I just turn my attention, and then I start to think of him. I know this is all so grim, but it's taught me a lot. Gotta treat girls right and stay the hell away from pot. That's what my mom always says. 
Damn, she's a rock. She's a reason for everything. Everything that we got, that's why I'm creating this plot. I gotta go get my spot. I gotta do something with my life and then I'll never ever stop. And when I think of giving up, I'll just think about the shot that she took for us. She carried us and she never ever dropped. Yeah, she's a rock. Yeah, she's my rock. She just keeps on pushing. And I've never seen her fold. I'm trying to think of a person with an ever bumpier road. She's always thinking about me. Damn, I wish she could see what being a father could be by just looking at what she has gone through for our family and she raised a fighter in me and I think my sisters agree. My mother set us free. This ain't just for myself and this ain't a cry for help. I'm just saying without family then what the hell is wealth? I don't know. Beauty. Beauty is on the inside and out. It's something that many will always doubt. It's in the eye of the beholder. It's constantly on display. It's a thing that I struggle with every single day. Our society is constantly demanding only the best, looking at, admiring those that consider them prettiest. They say, she is gorgeous, best dressed of the year, constantly applauding, commenting the Apollo. She gained some weight. Look at her hips. Do these things give them bliss? You hear from critics, from passers-by, from the people who see us cry. Our mothers, our fathers, their comments hurt when they tell their child who they've raised since birth. You look pretty, but you could lose some weight. If their goal was to bring us down, well, congrats. For me, it is too late. You've crushed my self-esteem completely, utterly flat. It sits there on the ground like a trampled-on doormat. You don't think first, you just speak your mind. Has society gone completely blind? Of course they haven't. Or they wouldn't see a difference between you and me. Instead of comparing the size of our waist, declaring who's in first or second place, they'd be helping us all learn to embrace the beauty we all have in this place. But that is a dream. So far from our current reality, I fear that many of us will struggle to walk around proudly. In our world, plus size and anything over size 14, the women, the models, the men, the people who are beautiful must be lean. By their definition, I should be ashamed that my hips, my stomach, my waist are not the size of a stick. I am big bodied, but I'm big minded, and I will not intolerate their in kindness. Their words are like bullets, but I can heal. I will keep smiling throughout the ordeal. I want a world where we can say, I am, we are beautiful in our own way. A letter of regret. When I first witnessed death, I don't think I really understood what it was. To me, it was that ant on the floor or the pet carnival fish we'd flush down the toilet. But most of all, it was that poor, helpless bumblebee who took its motivation and turned it into an overworking day collecting pollen that slowly weighted down to perish on the hot pavement of my childhood walkway. I pick it up dig a small hole and bury it where it'll soon be forgotten by the world that once thrived off of its work. It's inevitable, I thought, to die. When it happens, it happens, that is that, and we can't change it, so why do we try? Now, I've never had someone close to me die. Never had someone slowly waste away towards the imminent void that they cannot return from. I can't imagine the pain that you feel when you reach to try to grasp the depression that could be real. Yet, there's nothing I can do to stop that pain, to bring her back. I can't find a person to fill the spot or help you believe that you forgot. But at this moment, I think that I could have. I should have and I would have if only I had realized the regret I would face in the future. I could have been with you through those times that still often make you cry. I should have laid with you that night and told you it would all be all right. I would have never been so strong as you've been all along. But now you continue to amaze me every single day. And I want you to know how pained I am to have not been there for you. I'm sorry for the grief. And I am forever regretful towards the day that I learned what death really is. Winter is dead, joy 
joys too. Wait, what did I say? Winter joy is dead. The kids do play. On their phones instead. Look at all the snow. No kids outside. No snowballs thrown. No sleighs down the hillside. What's with these phones? All these collabs? I play with stones and huge snow caps. The purest childhood is one with games. That's our falsehood, though the minds of the, uh, the children, us teens, and even our parents are clean. Made snowmen, thrown snowballs. What is this omen? People surrounded by walls. People don't talk, they only text. Go take a walk and have your muscles flexed. Enjoy this winter wonderland before the beauty goes away and becomes a wasteland filled with slush of gray. I admit I gain, the ones played on the Wii. I should be ashamed, but this country is free. You guys don't leave your home. You sit and watch TV, drinking your coffees filled with foam and updated on Kylie. What's even the point of this? Why am I even talking? I'll be outside with bliss and go walking. You guys complain about your cars driving through the snow. Why not watch the stars that twinkle and glow? I hope I made my point through love, the one about going outside, the games that you all grew up. So please, put your phone aside. Backseat of a confined navy Chevy Malibu draped in the soft red glow of a stoplight and dulling city lights, feeling a faint repetitive tremor in the back right pocket, the back right pocket of those ripped jeans, the ones that show off my bare knees. The call is acknowledged with a sly yet questioning grin, and I'm completely blindsided to the sky opening up around me until I hear a voice on the end of the receiver shaking and quivering, bearing the news I am not capable of grasping, left alone again, left in the silence of the shadows. 10.04, the raindrops reluctantly cascade down the glass window, the sky's tears falling in sync with my own. Dull at first, and then a sudden storm, wishing time would only march back to the moment I last saw you smile, but the intervals merely crawl on, unfazed and unchanged. The preceding days are met with a collection of emotional overcast. The sunshine relapsing into darkening eclipses over the small engraved stone, shadowing the freshly unveiled earth. Minute sorrows of whisper, minute <laughs> whispers of sorrow circulate to ears both young and old until in time are met with silence the moment her white dress is seen at the head of the crowd. She positions herself, inhale, exhale, desperately trying to maintain her composure, broken pieces chipping away time after time after time, and my heart shatters at the thought of him ever thinking she was not worth fighting for, trying for, breathing for. My prayers are with you, they say. I'm so sorry, they say. Time makes it better, they say. Grasping to reflect the most poised and perfect sympathies, but only drowning her and strangling me with them. We become claustrophobic and estranged to our own grief. She was your kitten, and so was I. The purring of the engine of the car in the driveway is a constant reminder of that. The key in the ignition, igniting not only the engine, but the sparks to my own heart. And all I can do is wish that you were here. Boxes are piled high, maneuvered all around with your remaining paraphernalia. Small white pills lay scattered and in guilt on the dirty floor. The radio is still left on the station you last played. And all I can do is wish that you were here, singing alongside me in that stupid passenger seat. But the tears leave streaks as they roll down my face, onto the front of those ripped jeans, the ones that show off my bare knees, 
because while those painkillers may have eased your heart, they sure as hell did nothing for mine. Senior year. I think this year's made me a pathological liar. Yes, Mom, I finished all my homework. On time. Honestly, I'm not even that tired. And my favorite line, oh, yeah, I'm fine. Senior year is hell. And I can't do anything but hang on tight. Fingers red and raw from road burn and nail biting and essay writing and computer typing. I want to go farther. So I've been working a lot harder and being called smarter. But really, the ardor I once harbored for school is fading. Senioritis is real. And I didn't realize this until 3 a.m., four cups of black coffee, and nothing to show for my sleep deprivation. There is so much required of me, but I'm tired. All I need is a fuzzy blanket, steaming cocoa, my cat, and a needlepoint project to be happy. I guess I really am a senior. But there's no time for such blatant relaxation, languishing away in five advanced placements, running the school like the role model I'm supposed to be. And don't even get me started on colleges. All my knowledge is being wasted on contrived essays and what? Self-advertisement? I know just enough about what I want from life to know that I have outgrown high school. My dreams make this school feel like an old shirt with two short sleeves. I have found my passion in marine biology, but the seas that are calling to me are far too large to fit within these narrow halls. I want to be breathing in the ocean, salt in my hair, sand on my skin, basking under the glow of the sun, not these stifling fluorescent lights. squinty eyes of mine, who sit above my nose and upon my face to show the world what is my race, but you do not fault by the stereotypes of others, for you have allowed me to exceed among my brothers. You see, I sit in my car and among the open beach sands, and as the sun's rays come down, people try to use their hands to block the rays away from their eyes, but I continue to sit there and not have to try. <laughs> and as I walk into the classroom with the wind beneath my feet, I walk toward my chair and I drop in my seat. And with a pained expression, my friend looks toward me. And I think to myself, well, whatever could it be? So he hands me a paper full of equations, and I promptly respond, sorry, I'm only part Asian. <laughs> stand up at the top, wondering how to get out of it. You know you'll love it, but then again, what if you hate it? You see the water below you, a massive abyss into the depths of your heart. Uncertainty floods your mind, along with random, unsettling thoughts like those of your unfavored kin. Your father yells at you, screams at you, verbally pushes you off the edge. He scolds you, tells you it's only a jump, it's only a leap, it's only a cliff. His harsh voice echoes in your head. Grandmother stares you down from below, looking straight up at you. This glare, this glare, though, is like a mother grizzly bear's, beaming her eyes at you while she caresses her young cubs. This stare makes you feel like everyone's watching, waiting for your decision to stay or to jump. You're loving on. The ground beneath your feet keeps you out of harm's way. She is a sea nymph, soothingly convincing you to wait. She repeatedly offers you to stay in her warm home where it feels comfortable, where everything feels familiar. What will you do? Will you take the leap, risking the fragile health of your emotions? Or will you remain standing, escaping the dreadful pain that will come from your heart? Before you have time to think, someone, something pushes you. As you fall, you ask yourself, are you ready to make this commitment?
called The Power of Writing. My journey started out as any other assignment, a mere way to get out of work in class. I figured I would meander my way through it all with ease, a simple way to pass. Then I began to write. It started out as once a night, but as time went on, it turned into two, then three times a day, just so I could write down what I had to say. The words transformed, becoming real, not pixels on a screen, but people who could feel. They shared my emotions, my suffering, my happiness, and my pain. They held me close in a profound and binding dance while driving me insane. I gave them my time and my soul, but that was not the highest toll. In the end, I finally gave them the only thing I had left, my heart. Now, I am never alone, and nothing can tear us apart. Look back. What happened? Day of old, where we could have nap time and snacks? of which we looked forward to, but didn't understand why, to the days when adults would make PB and J for us. When we didn't have to drive, pay rent, make our own beds. No homework, no responsibility, no hormones. <laughs> Days of yore, the smell toxic green play doh, <laughs> broken crowns littering the floors, the feeling of absolute glee on Halloween night, candy crazed craniums keeping us up till dawn, Christmas even more so. SpongeBob was making us spew milk from our noses, <laughs> and Wheels on Heels were still a thing. No cleanup, no chores, no fault given. Bow! Bow down before me, for I am Batman. Yes, even on a Tuesday. In the grocery store. In my PJs. Yes, indeed. We were ninja turtles and princesses of our own world. stacks of cash meant five ones, two quarters, and a dime. <laughs> when being well read meant you knew of that hungry caterpillar. <laughs> no high school presentations, no stress, no difference between each other. At least I still got Pokemon. <laughs> judge me but read me. I want you to look at me and know who I am, know who I was. I want to scroll my past on my skin like a reminder for an appointment. I want to be dipped in my own history. That way, when I'm old and forgetful, all I will have to do is read the words so carefully etched into my skin, and I will remember. I will remember my past, and I will wear it proudly, tattooed permanently on my body.
This is a letter to my future self. When you're living comfortably, remember it was me who endured. It was me who battled with our brain and our bones. It was me who forced this vessel we call a body out of bed day in and day out, struggled day in and day out, so you could be where you are now. I'm not saying your life doesn't have its challenges, just remember mine. Remember the obstacles that almost drowned you. The ocean doesn't just disappear. You can't just forget the waves lapping at your ankles for years, pulling you down every so often, striving to stand up, even if you didn't want to. All the lessons you learned, I learned for you. Trial and error seemed to be my way of life, to make your way of life less awkward and miserable. Repeating situations in my brain, dissecting each moment so you don't make the same mistakes, plaguing my thoughts. Remember all I've done for you. If not, all the pain will have been for nothing. The waters did on drowning. The waters did not rush in so much as trickle. I didn't notice them at first, being the completely single-minded person that I was, and I stuffed a washcloth in the cracks in my head, absorbed the moisture through the kitchen sponge. For the leaks grew bigger, I took cups and buckets and pipes, but the water was unrelenting, and I had no other option but to give up and let the ocean rush in. And by that point, I'd used all my energy trying to keep it out in the first place, and I had nothing left to stop myself from sinking into its depths. It's deep, and it's dark, and it's murky, it's obscuring my every thought, making them doggy paddle through the waves before they can reach me. And by then they're all wet and soggy and tired, and why bother to think them, why bother to feel them, when it's all so much effort, anyway? My head used to be an echo chamber. My every motive amplified tenfold. My thoughts boomerang as I flew, arcing around and propelling themselves back to me, hitting the sides of my head and making craters where they landed, shaking me to the core. I was miserable. I was so miserable. But I could feel the misery. And I was exhausted, but I was exhausted like the hero of a zombie movie is exhausted. He hasn't slept in days, and he doesn't have enough food or water or warmth, but he's always going, 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 his adrenaline and his primal desire to live, keeping his feet pumping and his shots perfectly straight. Everyone told me I would get bitten eventually. I ignored the decay of my hand, my arm, my torso. I'm exhausted like the zombie is exhausted. I don't feel anything anymore. My mind is engulfed in an ocean. Everything I was and wanted to be has been lost in a chef track, and I've begun to realize that the Carpathia isn't coming. The person I was has been swept away from me. She's lost among the ice and debris and riptides, and I'm terrified that eventually her body will grow too heavy and her lungs will fill with water, and she'll be lost to me forever. And the ties that bind me to her have unraveled into a thread, and I can't figure out how to keep them from unspooling. And that every day it's hard for me to convince myself to get out of bed because why should I get out of bed when everything I care about is on dry land and I'm all the way out here? I do get out of bed, though. I cling to the thread that ties me to her. The more it slips through my hands, the harder I cling. And as long as I keep clinging to that thread, I can still pull it out of the way when the sharks come. I make myself get out of bed, and I make myself do my homework, and I make myself eat breakfast. Because I'm still holding on to that thread. And as long as she has any chance of returning, I'm going to keep her room neat and her bed made and, the life the, and her life the way she left it. I'm holding on. I'm holding on and I'm holding on. And I'll curl up on the floor for hours. I'll miss deadlines and due dates and appointments. I'll make my mother cry and fear for her only daughter. But I won't let go. I'm holding on to that thread. And for now, that's enough. But at one point, I'm going to start reeling it back in. Because everyone knows that zombies don't turn back into humans, but my life is not a movie directed by George Romero. And in my story, in the midst of groaning and shambling and craving human brains, the zombie just wants to be human again. And one day, she'll get to be. Because I remember the person I used to be. And she can make oceans evaporate. Thank you. Um, you probably remember, it'll be five years ago, come May, um, my friend Brian, he shot himself in the head, so, and he died, so I wrote this poem, kind of for myself and kind of for him, to honor the relationship that we had and just to remember him. So it's called Foggy Nights and Broken Lights. My laughter 
laughter is often confused with cackling, squabbles, and other assorted annoying accents. I laugh at every bad joke, every unexpected roast, kind of like a metronome. And if you know music, you know metronomes can get annoying pretty darn quickly. It's like my laughs try to quicken the pulse of life's constant beat. Laughter. Well, my laughter isn't always an expression of my joys. Often, my laughter is just a mask I wear. It is the fog hiding the road ahead. You don't want to get lost, so you just dim your lights and things aren't so bad. With your dimmed lights, you make it there. And no one even knew you were broken. I was 13 when my first headlight broke. He was 14. Both of his headlights had been broken for years. Not only because he wore glasses, but because no one bothered to check if there was any fuel. No one checked to see if there were any rusty bolts in the machine. And so his sand-filled jalopy trudged onwards until the day he cut his engine. The steel bullet flew straight from his ignition into my headlight. I kept driving, unaware of any injured pieces, until I pulled over and saw him sinking into the ground. My boyfriend, my best friend, my late night Xbox Live, Call of Duty Black Ops, partner in crime friend, my tell me what's wrong friend, my tell me again why you love me friend, my tell me how the stars shine just for me friend, my I miss you friend, my look at me from across a crowded lunchroom and mouth the words I love you friend, my yell my name and charge at me with open arms friend, my dark hair, hands in pockets, lips moving to the tune of that Eminem song you heard the night before friend, have you ever met anyone like that? Had someone who loves the rain almost as much as he loves you, we were told we could walk in between the raindrops, as if each one wouldn't leave behind a new scar. And so our childhood storm raged on and on and on until we were both caught in the blizzard, each snowflake putting distance between us. He kept searching the snow collecting in his boots, the cold eating at his fingertips, the wind whipping at his back with each broken promise as I found a new traveling partner who took me in. He remained on the outside, fighting against the world alone with nothing but a rusty dagger. By the time I abandoned my false pretense of new love to attempt to free him from the freezing torment, the snow had already buried him. No longer as my friend, but as my lone wolf who died and died. He died. She didn't. I'm still standing here. With tremendous guilt, I'm still standing. And although my tires are a little worn and although my door creaks when it opens, I'm still running. Sometimes we just need laughter to keep our engines running. Don't kid yourself, your character is not set in stone like granite. You may think your morning cup of coffee is the most enjoyable thing in the world, but it's really just a habit. 30 days without it and you would be fine, like all those cigarettes you used to smoke and boys you used to like wasting hours on end, killing not only yourself, but your soul in the process. You never actually need any of it. Habits develop like feelings you can't shake. You think you have found your soulmate, but in fact you could have any different number of lovers lined up in front of you like ducks in a row and be just as happy. Hell, maybe even happier. You can change what you want about yourself at any point in time. You see yourself as someone that can't play an instrument or write poetry, someone that gives into temptation and makes bad decisions, but that's really not all you. It's not ingrained into your soul. It's not a part of your DNA. It's not your personality. Your personality is something deeper than just preferences. These details on the surface, the band you like, the artist you adore, go ahead, dye your hair blonde, cut it into a bob while you're at it. You can change these aspects anytime you like. 
Stop giving everyone the benefit of the doubt. Don't give him that second, third, or even fourth chance. Sometimes it's wise. Sometimes it's wise to abandon these aged habits and start again. Sometimes it's the only way to gain a new perspective. Set fire to your old self. It's no longer needed here. It's too busy shopping, gossiping, and watching days go by asking why you haven't gotten as far as you'd like. This old self will die and be forgotten by all but your family because they don't seem to let anything go. Replace your old self by someone that makes a difference, if that's what you're going for. Someone that leaves an impression unlike the one you leave now, and don't back down because these second thoughts often turn into doubts. Now the point of all this isn't to say you can do anything you'd like in life and to go chase your dreams, because your new self is not like that. Your new self is like a hurricane, overwhelming, overpowering, and destroying anything that isn't necessary. Faster and faster, the car speeds down the road, picking up speed, accelerating, 30, 35, 40. He felt so hurt. He felt so lost. He didn't know what to do. His eyes were red. 40, 45, 50. He loved her. She was his everything. She, she was the one who hurt him. She betrayed him. 50, 55, 60. The road was long. The road was narrow. The road was curvy. Went up and down and left and right. 70, 75, 80. Tears rolled down his face. He couldn't breathe. He got all choked up. He started to become hysterical. 90, 95, 100. She lied to him. She told him that they would be together forever. She told him that she would never leave him, but it didn't matter anymore. 110, 115, 120. He didn't know what to do. He couldn't live without her. There was only one ladder. He closed his eyes and let go. 130, 135, zero. Not convinced. <coughs> After the ninth day, you walk by me with your head down and your eyes desperately searching for something to focus on, other than me. By the eighth time, you take no notice of the effort made in my attempt to cross paths and remind you, I'm still here. Our friendship has led to fake greetings and forced conversations, insisting for the seventh time you had been busy but are so sorry. When we have the same nasty argument for the sixth time that ends with empty apologies from both sides, or we decide to try and relight a smothered flame for the fifth time but the effort refuses to catch. And after the fourth painful week of not speaking and the third consecutively ignored text, this has become the second real loss I've known and the first true heartbreak I have sincerely felt. <coughs> after all this, I wonder, who were you trying to convince when you said you loved me and would always care? Me? This world is not safe. Every day we live in fear or uncertainty about the next terrifying acts. When will the next one come? Where will it come from? Who will be affected? How many people die? All unanswered questions until they don't matter, until they hold no weight in the world, taken from them, them the victims who no longer live in this world. Is that right? Sure, we can't predict these events. We can't hold accountable the unaccountable. Is that any excuse to be holding back? Holding back the information, holding back the fact that we do know, domestic or foreign, it doesn't matter. These roots are and have been in place for a long time, stemming from one region and one source. Yes, there are differences. There is diversity, however, not without underlying tells. These tells that with proper resources, proper intel, and proper communication could be figured out. These tells, however, are oftentimes left untold. Is that right? This group, these monsters, they have no shame, no remorse. They oftentimes own up to their success. At least, that's what they call these acts. To us, their tragedy and grief for them is the time to celebrate. Another one, dead. Another 10, dead. Another 100, dead. Another 1,000, dead. Is that right? Attack after attack, it goes on. One inability to act, one nation or groups of nations, inability to take the risk. They know what happens if they don't. 
They've seen it time and time again, and still they know we sit and wait. Let them make the next move so we can count the bodies and clean up their success. While they celebrate, we will once again contemplate our rules, a set of rules that only we play by, a set of rules restricting this great nation's ability to attack, ability to finish this war. Funny, in a way, how they are playing this game, and we are the only ones following these rules. Is that right? so upset. Cover your shoulders if it's distracting to others. You need to lose some weight. You're getting too fat. Here, wear this. You'll feel more comfortable. You're a fat girl. Fat girls can't wear bikinis. Fat girls can't wear a skin-tight dress. Fat girls can't do this. Fat girls can't do that. Well, what can we do? Society gives girls an image that needs to be followed have big boobs, have a big butt, have a flat stomach, have a nice smile, good hair, clear skin. We all must look like this. We are like cookie cutter houses, all the same inside and out. It's stupid. Society expects us to be perfect. What's the definition of perfection? Exactly. No one knows. We only have that twisted version that is drilled into our brains to a point where we just lose it. We break. We break down and cry. Crying is a sign of shut up! Just shut up. Knock, knock. You recognize it. The beginning of a joke. A theoretical portal placed before you with an infinite number of imaginary possibilities. Waiting just beyond the threshold, you reach your metaphorical hand forward to swing open the door. Who's there, you ask, elated at the present opportunity to capitalize on this comedic investment between us? Banana, I say dropping the peel on the floor, knowing full well one of us is going to slip. Banana who? Knock, knock. Back to the knocking, back to the banana behind the door, fruit faithfully reappearing with each repetition. Knock, 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 knock. Isn't it refreshing? <laughs> to know a joke is on its way by the friendly tapping on a door. I wish love were so announcing. A joke has a setup, a build, big flashing lights screaming, here comes the punchline. But love, love just kind of appears. Falling in love is slipping on a banana, unaware it's about to happen. The unsorted heart hardly hears the crescendo of romance. Prior to love being at the welcome mat. And if you could be warned, how could I describe the face of a guest so ambiguous? Some say kind cheeks, others only lustful eyes, or a trembling lip, or a confident brow, or the spontaneity of the freckles on his chin, or the security in an inconsistent grin. Really, love has as many faces as the moon has phases, and is undefined by definition, as subjective as art. And what of the end of love? When a joke ends, even a bad joke, you and I still agree the joke was made. But when the hearth of the heart goes cold to the touch, and that charming guest makes his bittersweet departure, we ask ourselves if love had visited at all. From no other emotion do we command such constancy. Sadness is but a temporary grieving. Anger passes, fading, leaving. Happiness is fleeting. But love, oh, love is an eternal being. To possess now is to own forever, they say, and it only exists in a world where we don't change, don't grow, don't put distance between us, don't follow our dreams where they lead us. Don't try to complete yourself. This concept dictates you need someone else to be immortal. But this variation of love is a silly joke. Love doesn't have to be everlasting to be true, because I remember you and I under the summer starlit night, your figure illuminated by celestial light, your face reflecting love. Warm brown eyes, black hair, 
cut short revealing all the more the gorgeous expression every sense is intensively, splendidly amplified. The moon gleams brighter because you smile towards it. Your heart beats, 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 beats so loudly, I count my blessings by it. To risk or not risk, moon gleams, heart beats, lips meet, time falters and slowly descends into an abyss of bliss. Leaving that moment our moment eternal. That is the immortality of love, to catch a moment in the streams of time and crystallize into some rare gem so that all other memories may be swept away. But this beautiful moment can only be polished by the passage of time. And then time carried on, and we grew and changed and followed our dreams where they led us happily even if it grew the distance between us. And to my future love, I ask that you be like my favorite joke. Be clear and knock so that I know when you are here and continue to knock and knock and knock and I will continue to open the door to find you. And if you find, you grow and change, I'll open to the knock to find orange and know that love has left us, not empty handed but with a sweeter memory. Knock, knock. Thank you, Sam. So we're gonna give our judges a moment to confer with one another. And um, Mary Catherine, who's been so gracious to work the mic for us. to thank our judges again. And uh, we're going to invite all of the contestants up uh, to the stage, take some photos, and Summer Whitmore is going to tell us who, who uh, placed in the top three. <laughs> I feel I feel so lucky to have been a part of this. This has been really beautiful. It's so nice that we're all in this room and we were able to share that with everyone. So thank you all for coming and, and giving your attention and thank you everyone to perform. So let's give a one more round. Score for the evening. We have Garrett. Kim <laughs> 